Good afternoon, depending where you are watching from. And welcome to the 2020 Chatham House Summer School. My name is Alice Martin and I'm the Internships and Outreach Manager at Chatham House. And I'm delighted to be chairing and convening this event. I'm especially pleased that you have joined us today in such strong numbers with participants from over 32 countries. I'm very grateful that you have found the time to join us this week. So thank you. As a warm up before we dive into this session, I would just like to invite everyone to send us a quick hello on the Q&A chat, just to tell us from which country they are tuning in and what is the time where you are. So it's 2 p.m. in London, and we have a fairly lovely sunny day, and I hope you will enjoy um, your time today and this week with us. The coronavirus pandemic affecting the world has led to worldwide school closures. This means that teachers, parents, and students had to adapt on a daily basis to changing situations. Many of you have reflected on this in your registration messages and wrote about your school closures, cancellation of your exams, and uncertainty for the future. As lockdowns begin to ease and some have returned to school this week for their last week of uh, term, I'm pleased to see that there is so much enthusiasm to join our program. So what are the objectives for this week? Well, let me share some of your messages first, if I may. I intend to study politics and hope that this program can help me learn skills that would be beneficial towards that. I hope to gain an insight on how think tanks operate and I'm unsure about my career choices at the moment. I would like to learn more about Chatham House, meet the researchers and hear about their career path. I would like to undertake an internship at Chatham House and would like to know how to prepare for work experience. Well, you have shown us what you are hoping to take, take away from this week. And as you are thinking about the subjects to choose for your A-levels or applications for university or your future career paths, we hope that by the end of this week, we will provide some insights into careers within our sector share top tips on developing new skills, and in particular, share our passion for international affairs. So before we dive into our first session, I would like to briefly go over the format for the week, introduce some housekeeping rules, and provide a brief overview of our institute. So the program takes place over five days every day from two to half past three, and you can use the same Zoom link every day. So with the COVID crisis, we are not able to meet in person, which is a little sad for us. So let's embrace this opportunity for meeting virtually, joining from our homes, or in my case, my dining room. No matter how strange it seems, so let's have an interactive and engaging week. Please do not shy away from asking questions answering polls and providing feedback. You will see on your screen, there is a Q&A function. You can type in your questions at any point throughout the day and choose to send it either anonymously or under your name to the moderator. We have two moderators today. Their names are Amrit and Ludivine, and they are assisting us today with behind the screen logistics. So hello to both of them. If you would like to um, ask your question in person, please raise a hand, a small blue hand to indicate so, and we will unmute you so we can hear your voice. You can also choose to um, ask your question anonymously or you can introduce yourself. We will make sure that there is plenty of time for your questions. This event is also being recorded and there will be a link to the recorded version sent to you on completion of the program. Throughout the week in preparation for each day, we will send you some reading material and you have probably noticed my email over the weekend. Now, this is optional and we do not require, we do not require any preparation, but as many of you have asked for recommendations for summer reading, 
we are providing some materials and I hope this will be useful. You will also receive copies of all PowerPoint presentations and we will send you some key takeaway notes. So as you may know, especially if you watch the recommended webinar over the weekend, the future of think tanks, this is our centenary year. The Institute is 100 years old this year. So if I may share just a little bit about the history of the Institute, it all started back in Paris in 1919 during the Paris Peace Conference when Lionel Curtis, a British diplomat, delivered an inspiring speech to the British and American delegates. His idea was to create an organization for international relations whose purpose would be to foster mutual understanding between nations through debate, dialogue, and analysis. Out of this idea, two organizations were born. In London, the British Institute of International Affairs, later to be known as Chatham House, and in New York, the Council on Foreign Relations. 100 years on, Chatham House continues this legacy through our mission to help governments and societies build a sustainably secure, prosperous, and just world. And how do we do that? Through independent thinking, through dialogue, through analysis, debate, and creating ideas. Our centenary is not just about reflecting on our past, but it is also about our vision for the future. And that vision is to empower and develop the next generation of leaders in international affairs. And we hope that this summer school will also contribute to this mission. Now, will the world be able to solve the climate change? What will the future of the Middle East look like? Why do we need to know about China and its ambition in becoming a technological champion? Now, these are just some of the questions we seek to answer this week. Over the course of the week, you will meet 25 staff members across 11 different programs. It would be really impossible to cover everything, but we would like to highlight just some of the research areas to give you a small insight of our work. Today, we are focusing on Africa, the world's youngest continent and I'm delighted to introduce my colleagues from the Africa program. Yusuf Hassan, who is the Parliamentary Media and Outreach Officer, Hannah Destam, Program Assistant, and Fergus Kell, Project Assistant. Yusuf, over to you. Great, great. Thank you so much, um, Alice, for your kind invitation, and thank you to each and every one of you for attending this really, really important session. Um, I think on behalf of the Africa program, we are so, so uh, proud to be uh, kicking off this, uh, this summer school with the initial, um, with the initial session. Um, we are, of course, very proud uh, also to, to, to be doing this in the, in the midst of our centenary year at Shatham House. Um, Alice just mentioned uh, Lionel Curtis, one of the founders on the, of the Institute, and he himself was someone who served in South Africa and... Um, is very clear knowing that his a lot of his beliefs about multilateralism about working together uh, across the globe were formed um, in his time um, in south africa with a lot of the initial money um, for the institute coming from africa itself therefore uh, i think it's very very poignant that, uh, that the africa program is uh, the the beginners of this uh, discussion um, amrit could you kindly please put up the powerpoint if that's okay um <clears throat> In the meantime, um, this session is, of course, uh, Africa, the world's youngest continent, um, and I will be delivering it with my colleagues, Fergus and Hannah, each of whom uh, I am very lucky to work with, as they are very knowledgeable and I'm sure will be able to help me answer some of your great questions. But to begin, um, um, I'll go to the first slide, and that is, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear Africa? please do answer in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll give you maybe about a minute. I think I'm being uh, a bit uh, harsh, but uh, I do want to get through the presentation. So guys, um, please, please. What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Feel free to uh, uh, answer with uh, the most sincere answer that you can think of. There's no need to uh, 
uh, there's no need to. <clears throat> okay. Great, great, great. Seeing some very interesting answers. Um, there's, there are 400 of you, uh, 400, sorry, uh, 400 plus of you. Therefore, I do expect at least 350 before I move on. Come on. Um, so I think that's only, that's only fair, Alice, right? Yes. Of course. Thank you. If Alice says so, then, uh, then, I, then I'm lucky to, to continue that way. These are all very, very great. Completely agree about the beautiful nature. Completely agree about that. Um, when Corona eventually... Uh, settles down I hope we'll all travel to the beautiful continent um, okay great I have quite a bit now therefore I will continue um, I think it's a fundamentally difficult question to answer there are so many different things I think that come to mind um, to many and of course that is informed by um, the world that we live in um, and of course the way that Africa is covered generally Therefore, um, there, is no, there is no right answer here. In reality, it's all determined by what you are exposed to, the, the curricula that you have gone through as school students. And, and of course, uh, and in reality, I think it's, uh, it, for us, the most important thing is actually seeing so many engaged answers. Um, and I think the perfect answer that I'll probably begin with um, that I'll use to begin is one from Rayan Rashid. I do apologize if I mis, uh, mis, uh, pronounce that, but uh, their answer was a misunderstood continent that many people aren't fully educated on. And I think that's the perfect uh, way to begin uh, this presentation. Yes, um, unfortunately, uh, Africa seems to be a blind spot in many people's uh, minds, like many of the countries that we all hail from and I think our hope at the program and at the Africa program has always been to provide those answers that people are looking for. To give a brief overview on the Africa program, the Africa program develops policy oriented research on issues affecting both the individual states of Africa, their own international relations and then the continent as a whole. Since its establishment in 2002, um, not too long after I was born, and let alone many of you on this call, um, the Africa program has become an independent center for uh, policy research and debate on Africa's politics um, and socioeconomic change by working with some of the best international experts. The program is a hub for thought leadership on Africa, providing and producing reliable analysis and disseminating findings globally through our convening power and networks. Now, um, now I've gone through what the Africa program is and we've discussed to a certain extent what people's thoughts are on Africa uh, when they first hear it. I'll move on to the next slide, which really provides you a, a contextual picture of, of what Africa is. I think, uh, I think we all have grown up with the uh, Mercator uh, <clears throat> depiction of the globe through our global maps where Africa appears big, but not too big. Um, and it's widely misleading. Um, this, the world map that we use often in a lot of our educational systems is from the 16th century and, and actually distorts the sides of, of many countries. And to a certain extent, many have stated that this could have been or, or was related to a general understanding of imperialism. And because this, of course, this map was produced in the West to provide a picture that made the West look as uh, large or as overwhelming as other uh, places in the world. But if you're looking solely through from a context perspective, both the, the, the larger part of the United States of America, China, India, Japan, the vast, major, the, the vast part of Eastern Europe, the UK, where I'm from and I'm and, and, and presenting this from, Italy, Germany, France and Spain, including Portugal, all fit inside uh, Africa if you were to really base it solely off area or land mass, right? So this is, a, this is a really, really important picture for you to understand and for all of us to understand that the Africa that we have been taught that, that has, has informed some of your answers is also one that is much larger than most of us can even think of, right? And this is a really important, I think, place to start because what we're talking about here isn't necessarily just a small part of the world. We're talking about a huge, huge, huge entity that um, plays a part in all of our lives. Moving on to this next slide, if I could kindly ask. 
question. Another really, really quick one. I'll probably give you less time because I think it's uh, it might be more difficult, but I think it's a quicker answer. What are the world's youngest countries? Let me see if any of you can get answers uh, in uh, in the in the Q and A box that might be on the list that I have. World's youngest countries. Yes. So these are the world's youngest countries according to research by the UN World Population Prospects paper published by the World Economic Forum. And I think you can notice something quite early on if you look through all the countries. They're all based where? Sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, really, really, uh, it's really, really interesting when you think about it. If you think about the median ages are on this, I think that probably takes up the, 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 the general trend of people within this call from the ages of 15 to about 18. I think it's really, really um, interesting when you think about it from a, from a, from a, from a policy making perspective or from a thinking about Africa and moving forward perspective because these countries, of course, each of them have such young populations, which means that you have the opportunity to, to really benefit and, and grow from younger populations. Younger populations are much more likely to, 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 to be able to invest in innovation, to find new ways of thinking and to ensure that the continent that we find today might not be the same continent that we are looking or talking about in, in 30 years from now. Mm -hmm. I think when you think about Africa from the perspective of, of the youth, I think it's the most important perspective because 60% of, uh, of Africans are under the age of 25. The median age, so the average age is that of 19. Um, and in comparison, in, in North America, the answer to that question would be 35. And of course, that, that shows you something, right? That gives you an understanding as to perspectives and how it's changed. And the number of young people in Africa is expected to grow quite exponentially in the decades ahead, but I will go into that shortly. And this, of course, plays a part with regards to simple things like the demographic dividend, which means um, that the labor force uh, will be growing with fewer children to support. And that means the country has an opportunity for economic growth if the right social and economic investment uh, and policies are made in, in the different key areas. And the, the simple reality of that is that because Africa is likely to have one of the world's largest working age populations uh, in the coming decades the output from this population will be will be huge but i will move on to the next slide because that that, that speaks to that directly um, no, um, if we look at the percentage share of global population um, in comparison between um, 2015 and 2050 so we're only talking about a 35 year gap of sorts but Africa's percentage of the global population will be 20 or a quarter of the globe's global population will be in Africa by, by 2050. That is a huge number. One that I think really should, uh, should, should be really, I think, hopefully uh, creating some enthusiasm in your mind as to why Africa is such an important part of the world that we all have to recognize it is not an afterthought. It is a huge, huge, huge population, each of whom are incredibly important individuals who all have the ability to change the world and our hope should be to to support where possible to uplift and to and to work on actually uh, making the world a much more equitable place moving on to economic growth because i don't want to take too much time out of the q a i'm sure you all have incredible questions um amrit please um economic growth there are really really interesting and, and positive trends that are of course taking place i'm going to use a, a small caveat to say that this is pre uh, coronavirus projections therefore of course there will be some there will be some uh, hit from 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 what the pandemic has done but the general trend was a positive one um and one that actually showed that africa was on the path quicker if you look at the graph itself quicker than the other emerging and developing economies um, towards growing in GDP. I know GDP, for, for those of you that are much more interested in e economics and want to study economics, it may not be the best barometer, but uh, Africa was on the path to uh, 
effective and, and, and substantial economic growth over the next coming years. And when you marry that up with population growth at the same time, there is a huge opportunity there. Um, in 2034, Africa is expected to have the largest, the world's largest uh, working age population of 1.1 billion people, each in the job market. In recent times, and this is of course uh, over the last five, five years, we've seen 21 million new stable formal wage paying jobs uh, be created in Africa and 53 million over the last 15 years. And generally we see this is quite, uh, this is, this is quite a positive trend and one that we can benefit from um, continentally. Africa is urbanizing and uh, this is a really important point because uh, with, with the likelihood being that an additional, over the next decade, 187 million Africans will live in cities. And um, this is according to the United Nations. And this, of course, is important because productivity in cities is three times um, as high as in uh, rural areas. And I think this is something that we can all learn and understand as a really, really important point. And I think consumerism and, and of course, expansion with regards to infrastructure and, and, and the ability for, 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 for benefits for the population of these countries with regards to their ability to buy things will also grow. Um, the, the country itself uh, is, ex is expecting the projection is Africa's consumers will spend two trillion by 2025. Two trillion is a, is a huge number, one that is quite difficult to even put into, into your mind sometimes, but it's, uh, it's really, really great to see that this ec economic growth is taking place. If I ask Amrit to move on to the next slide, if she could kindly. Democracy in Africa. This is an, another important part, uh, and one that I myself, as a as a as someone who works as a parliamentary officer for the for the Africa program and who's always been interested in politics, finds fascinating, because the world's youngest continent, the one that I am presenting on currently, is being run by its oldest leaders, <laughs> the world's oldest leaders, but the youngest people. It's uh, it's it's quite laughable when you think about it, but that's the reality of uh, of what it is. But we are seeing positive trends. We are seeing half of uh, Africa's longest serving leaders have left or have been ousted in the last two years. And this is a positive sign of showing how young people are now taking the lead, taking the initiative and ensuring that they will no longer be ruled by people that are three or four times their ages, which is, which is quite incredible when you think about it. Um, and demo democratic consolidation in Africa is also taking place generally at a higher rate than, 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 than other parts of the world. Um, this graph at the bottom shows um, MENA, which refers to Middle East, North Africa, compared to Sub-Saharan Africa, compared to the world in general up until, tw and this was published in 2017 uh, by the Brookings Institute, which is another great think tank if you want to learn about Africa and, 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 and generally about international affairs. Um, so this is a really, really important, I think, um, graph that shows you that there is a increase. I think some of your answers in the Q&A box were framed around how there was a lack of democracy or, or old leaders amongst other things. And this is something that shows us all that things are changing, at least um, with regards to democratic representation. The important element of this, I think, is for, for us to understand that this is a journey. Of course, we aren't going to go from a difficult situation to the most beneficial or positive one, but we are seeing trends that show that young people are no longer interested in being uh, in being. Uh, ruled by those that are much older than them and don't really have their interests at heart, especially with the growing population. If we can move on to the next slide. Africa's technology boom. This is something that really, really, really inspires me. I think the, the, the graph itself or the, the, the graphic itself shows something really interesting because African economies are well positioned to benefit from technological increases in the sense that um, just when I went to school, for example, uh, especially when I was much younger, the norm for everyone having a smartphone wasn't the reality, right? I'm assuming those on this call that are older than me will say even less. Everyone didn't have a laptop at home. Everyone didn't have an iPad. Technology wasn't something you really, really engage with that much. And I'm not even that old. Um, I hope anyway. Um, Africa is well placed because we're not starting from where we started 20 years ago in, in, in Europe, where that may be in an infrastructural sense. In Africa, you can possess a smartphone tomorrow and you can move on from that. You're not dealing with working through the, the stages of technology, right? You have the immediate technology, you have the ability to install 
and work on the best software immediately instead of working towards it as you would in other sectors. And this is something that I think that's really interesting. The growth of tech hubs and these hubs being incubators for African tech leaders to work together, to create new apps, to create new companies, to create new ideas, all focused on supporting and developing the African economies themselves. And of course, exporting to the wider world is really, really cool. Just in the previous couple of years, we've seen a doubling from 314 in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, to 643 now. This is, uh, this is really, really, sorry, that was 2017, so just in three years. Um, we've seen huge growth, and I think this is an opportunity or a place where Africa can really benefit from. But, of course, this differs across the continent. There will be places where technology won't be as accessible, but we're all working towards that to a certain extent, um, and it's something that I think we can all learn from. Um, Moving on to the last slide, um, and this is a, a very important one, climate change in Africa. And I think this is one that really, really puts into focus uh, some of the work that you will be engaging with over the coming week and some of the work that we do at the programme. Climate change is an important thing for each and every one of us, regardless of what age we are. But if we think about it merely from scale, the, the, the graph on the left shows carbon, that shows fuel emissions or, or, or CO2 emissions. Um, from different countries and it's fascinating that if you look at the green which is where Af which refers to Africa um, four percent from Africa whilst the population itself is closer to 17 percent at current and by 2050 will be a quarter of the popula population of the world and it shows the unfairness of it more when you look at the right uh, at the, at the, at the graphic on the right which shows the anticipated climactic impacts of climate change on the continent. And that is deforestation, desertification, which means the creation of new deserts that hadn't existed before, which of course means a loss of land and the opportunity for people to benefit agriculturally from that land. We find an increase in, in precipitation, which of course leads to more flooding and, and difficulty. And especially in countries where you won't have the same level of infrastructure, this can play a huge part in people's um, lives and actually them effectively surviving and it also leads to uh, migration and this is an important part countries become and cities become much more populated when the rural areas are no longer able to be populated because of the climate change difficulties that populations will be facing which leads to overcrowding which leads to increased likelihood of disease outbreaks because people will be living in closer proximity to one another. So this is an important point for each of you to understand that Africa is one of the biggest losers due to climate change, but is one of the smallest with regards to size. And think about the first slide when we spoke about how large Africa is with regards to how it loses, even though emissions wise, it isn't necessarily as prolific as some of the other countries that are on this list. And I think that's a, somewhere of a, a decent place to end and pass it on to my uh, very talented colleagues, uh, both Fergus and Hannah. I think uh, we will begin, if I'm not mistaken, with Fergus. And I think Amre, it's, uh, the, his slides are on the same PowerPoint, if that's okay. And I'll pass it over to Fergus. Fergus. Thank you very much, Yusuf. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking with all of you as part of this great initiative. Um, and a big thank you to Alice as well for all of her hard work on this. Um, so she was the person that looked after me when I started at Chatham House um, as an intern a few years back. So it's nice to sort of come full circle a little bit and, and help her out on this important project. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from some of you during uh, the discussion and Q&A um, shortly as well. So I'm conscious as well that this is the first event of the week um, and I remember even when I started I didn't have the clearest idea of what exactly a think tank like Chatham House is or maybe more importantly what it actually does. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about one aspect of what we do as the Africa program which is the project side of things uh, and then I think Hannah will speak a little bit more to the events and the convening aspect. So even though we work from London the majority of the time, the project work tends to be the element of what we do that's most often based outside of London and on the continent itself. So I'll talk about a few examples of projects that we've done that involve work in Africa. And um, a bit of quick background on my role. Um, I'm the project's assistant for the program, which means I support mainly on the administrative side of these projects. So keeping track of the finances, scheduling meetings, helping run events and organizing travel, that sort of thing. 
Um, so Emma, if we could go to the next slide. Um, so we have a few broad thematic areas that our research covers. And um, so I'll speak about a few individual projects that, that fit into three of these areas. So under this um, theme of inclusive economic growth, governance and technology, um, we have this Zimbabwe Futures project. So Zimbabwe has been emerging from a tradition, uh, transition after the end of Robert Mugabe's leadership. So something that Yusuf spoke to a little bit trying to rebuild its economy and reset its foreign relations. So this is a long-term issue. And you know, some of you may have heard previously about the, the famous hyperinflation issue from back around 2008, where you, know, you had suddenly a loaf of bread in, in the country costing something like 30 million Zimbabwe dollars. So um, you know, clearly a, a kind of long-term issue there. And last year, my colleagues Chris and Knox worked to organize a series of private roundtable discussions across Zimbabwe, which brought together the local business community and the government. And the aim of the project was to provide a sort of forum for open discussion around these issues um, and around the best policy and business strategies to support long-term economic recovery in that sense. Um, and the project culminated in a short paper, which you can see on the right of the screen there, which was then launched publicly at an event in Harare, which is also, public, uh, also pictured there. Um, so another similar project to, to speak to under this theme is the Sudan Stakeholder Dialogues project um, in the bottom right there. So Sudan is also currently undergoing a major transition after they ousted their former president, um, Omar al-Bashir, and he was president for, for 30 years. So he featured on that kind of long-term leaders graphic that Yusuf showed us earlier. And uh, this project is a similar idea in the sense that we organized a series of three uh, roundtables at the beginning of last year hosted in three different countries, um, which brought together a really diverse group of participants. So people from the old regime, um, opposition, international experts, to discuss the situation that was happening and, and the ways to move things, things forward. And that led to a short research um, paper, bringing together the findings. And this was launched at a major international conference in Sudan last October. So maybe the first such uh, conference to take place there since the transition sort of got underway. Um, and we have the new Prime Minister of Sudan giving the opening remarks there. So I think both of these projects under this theme are a good example of, of what we do in that, you know, it's offering a neutral space and a forum for a discussion between people who otherwise might not have the chance to speak to each other and to have their voices heard. Um, and so this dialogue side of things is, is a really big element of what we do. Um, so if we could go to the next slide. Uh, then the next slide is a, is a project with a slightly different research process. So um, this SNAG, Social Norms and Accountable Governance project, um, looks at uh, social norms around the issue of corruption, which um, again, I think is something that came through in the, in the Q&A box when you were asked to give, give your kind of views on, on Africa, what came to mind. Um, so a social norm un, under the kind of definition of this project is a particular type of collective behavior whereby the way in which you act is based upon a belief that you have the other, um, around how other people think. So it's whether you think that other people think that people should conform to a behavior. So this is one way of explaining why in some, uh, in some countries, African or otherwise, even though people might have personally very strong views against corruption, which is you know, often the case and, and often the case in, in countries in Africa with, um, with you know, rampant issues of corruption, um, it's still widespread. So it explains, for example, um, possibly why public anti-corruption campaigns, which show corruption as being really widespread, um, might not actually be that helpful in actually preventing it, um, because they might confirm these, these expectations around social norms. So this project is based in Nigeria, um, and I saw we have, we have quite a few people uh, on the call from Nigeria, so uh, welcome to you and, and great, great that you're, you're listening. Um, and it happens in Nigeria through a nationwide survey. So to do this, we as a program working together with the University of Pennsylvania, um, we've trained a lot of different local groups um, who are all in that picture on the left um, to carry out surveys. So that picture is from a training workshop um, in the capital. There have been two phases of surveys and altogether we've surveyed about 10,000 households all across the country. Um, and more recently, 
So towards the end of last year, we expanded this project into Kenya with a short scoping project exploring the anti-corruption landscape there. So uh, this photo on the right is of us engaging with a local civil society organization and, and learning more about how they work to tackle corruption in local government. Um, so again, I think this project, and in a slightly different way to the, the first slide, it's a really good example of the value of local networks and capacity building. So using and benefiting from experience on, you know, on the ground in the country. And that's something, um, you know, so it, it shows an aspect to our work that's, you know, not just based out of London, which I think is really important. Um, and the next slide. So just the final slide to, talk about. Um, so under this theme of foreign relations and Africa's agency in the international system, which is a really important theme to what we do. Um, so this project um, looks at relations between Central and Eastern Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa. So the idea here is that many of these countries in both regions have historical connections dating back to the time of the Eastern Bloc and the Soviet Union. And back then there was a lot of cooperation between the regions, you know, from things like military support all the way to education. So, for example, a lot of these kind of long-term African leaders that we've spoken about a few times in the past, they went and studied in Eastern Europe. So there's those historical ties there. Um, but with the fall of the Berlin Wall, these countries had a major transition period. Um, and so, you know, many of them are, are now new EU member states. And so for a time, these relationships with Africa faded away a bit. So this project looks at how those historical ties are opening back up, how both regions can learn from each other. And that's a really important aspect. It's about two-way learning, you know, what can these countries in Europe learn from Africa as, as well as what can Africa learn from Europe. Um, uh, so this takes place, um, so we have uh, the pictures on the right are three of our researchers on the project. So it happens in collaboration with our Academy for Leadership, which is something um, Alice, I think, can, can definitely speak to a bit more throughout the week, possibly. And the research is done by these fellows who come for a one-year research placement at Chatham House. So maybe we could move on to Hannah, if you, Hannah, you're still online, it seems yep. Fergus has lost his Wi-Fi. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, no worries. Um, and thank you. Let me just echo Fergus and Yusuf's thanks. And I'm sure everyone else's thanks to you for organizing this initiative and to all the students here for sure showing up um, during your summer holidays. So my name is Hannah um, and I'm the program assistant with uh, Chatham House's Africa program. Um, and my role is um, quite a wide ranging one, but I generally support the operational aspects of our core activities um, including the day-to-day -day administrative matters, communications, finances, um, and a big part of that is also um, on organizing events in the program, which um, both Yusuf and Fergus have um, discussed um, a bit. Um, and so events are a really central part of what the Africa program, as well as the broader institute, um, do as the primary vehicle for dialogue and debate, which is at the core of of what Chatham House, what Chatham House is, uh, a, a platform for um, varied and diverse um, thought and exchanges of perspectives and, and, and views to inform um, policy processes. Um, so um, within the Africa program, we, we tend to organize around 120 to 160 events on average um, a year. And those cover um, uh, a range of, of topics um, um, at a country specific level, at a regional level, at a trans regional level. And so I thought I would start off with a slide displaying um, our most recent um, event as part of our centenary celebrations um, and focus especially on an event held last Friday um, just to kind of illustrate some of the um, reasons that we hold the event, uh, our events, and um, the ways that they um, have have you know an impact and feed into the discussions that are particularly prominent um, uh, for 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 Africa and uh, more generally. Um, so um, the event that we held on Friday, for example, was um, one that explored the the two speeches um, at Chatham House um, made in 1968 and in 1985. Uh, by two liberation leaders. Um, and at this event, we brought together the um, 
Nialeti Manlani, who's a Minister of Gender, Children and Social Action in Mozambique, and um, um, Her Excellency Nama Tembo Tambo, who's the South African High Commissioner to, UK, to the UK. Um, and um, this was an event uh, that was designed to um, bring out reflections on the points of change and continuity in the, in the messages that were delivered by these two liberation leaders um, in the 1960s and 80s um, within the context of this um, movement that I'm sure everyone here is well, well aware of um, and, and following um, around uh, Black Lives Matter and the general um, anti-racism movement that has been gaining momentum, uh, especially in recent months. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I guess within this current uh, climate, um, yeah, I, I guess within this current climate where there is kind of a re-questioning of our history and especially a re-questioning of reinterrogation of historical figures and monuments, uh, this was an important um, event to also look at the other side in terms of elevating and re-examining um, the, the, the figures that perhaps don't have statues erected in, in their name within this, within this country and that perhaps people aren't as aware of um, or as intensely, you know, academically aware of um, because of the context of our curriculum and our, and our, the, 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 the kind of information that is available to us um, in mainstream, in mainstream kind of fora. Um, and so um, what, this, what this event did was number one, um, integrate that kind of continuity between um, the various figures that we convene at Chatham House. And the convening power um, is, is one of the strengths that we, we very much have within the, within the Institute, the ability to bring together disparate actors and actors that um, perhaps are not necessarily popular within um, like one given moment. And I, and I say this in the context of this specific event because it brought out a speech made by um, Oliver Tambo, who was an anti-apartheid politician, who at the time that he made the speech wasn't actually allowed to interact with government officials in the UK. Um, and so I think there is increasing conversation um, now around Africa because of growing interest over the years. Um, and because of also you know, increased engagement from within Africa and Yusuf to talked about the technology boom and part of that is, you know, increasing access to um, mobile phones, to social, to social media platforms um, and within Africa, I mean, I think some people might be surprised that 75% of um, Africans now have, you know, access to, access to a phone um, and, um, and with that comes, you know, increased engagement, but on the other, on the other hand, we have, um, I think another problem is that there is somewhat a climate of more siloed spaces for engagement and increasing pressures to say the right thing, to um, take the right side. And that's where Chatham House, I think, comes in useful in the sense that it brings together um, people with differing ideologies, differing backgrounds, um, differing sectoral backgrounds, um, and puts them in, puts them in the in the same space, and um, also in a space where you know it's it's very much encouraged to 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 say to say anything really. And we have you know various uh, mechanisms in order to encourage that that kind of fruitful conversation. And so on the next slide, um, we also have a quick description of what the renowned Chatham House rule is, um, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, and so this is, uh, contrary to some misconceptions, it's one singular rule as opposed to Chatham House rules. Um, and um, it is also, it also doesn't mean that you can't, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't mean off the record in the sense that you can't actually say what was said in, in one space outside, but it just means that you can't a, a, attribute what was said to a specific person. Um, and so in the events that I just talked about, for example, um, that event with the Daughters of These Liberation Leaders were, was held publicly, but the, this, the speech that was made by um, the father of, of Noah Tambo, um, that, was made, that, was, that was done under the rule. And that was you know, partly um, to, to um, in, 
to encourage and to allow um, that person to, to, to speak about a sensitive subject, as, as sensitive as it got in those days. Um, and so, yeah, um, the other events are kind of, that I've displayed here, um, kind of are typical of the kind of events that we convene. Um, so we um, hosted Alassane Otara from um, the, the current president of Cote d'Ivoire earlier in January, um, but this, you know, this also followed um, an event in November with um, uh, a, cont a contender of his in, in, the, same, in the same country, um, Soro, um, which, uh, Guillaume Soro. Um, and this, as I said, is part of that um, effort within Chatham House to ensure that we have balance in terms of the kind of perspectives that are, that are provided and that are platformed. Um, and so, yeah, Fergus has already mentioned the projects that we do and how central dialogue and um, inclusive participatory kind of stakeholder round, roundtables were to those projects. Um, but another part is also the um, dissemination um, stage of, of, the, of the events that we do and the research projects that we undertake. Um, and as well as the, the, the high, high level events themselves. Um, and so one of these um, uh, images here also is of um, President Kukwete of Tanzania um, speaking at an African agency conference, which we held in Addis Ababa, which is uh, the, like one, of, one of the hubs of kind of African engagement. Um, and it was fitting and appropriate that we would host an event like that about African agency on the, on the continent itself. Um, uh, yeah, so that is all for me on events as, as a starter. I don't want to go on for too long, especially as we've already taken up quite a bit of time and we want to leave time for questions, which I'm sure there are great questions for him. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, my colleagues from the Africa program. Thank you so much for, for the presentations. Um, we are running uh, a tight on time. So let's jump straight into questions. Before we start, um, let me just say those who would like to ask that question in person, please raise the blue hand so we know we can identify who you are and we can unmute you. Um, but let's start uh, with a question from, um, let me see, Ben Whitehead. How do you think Africa will be able to feed its ever increasing population while it battles with its climate and lack of um, availability to grow food? You saw this, this was one of your last sort of slides when you spoke about climate change and those challenges. Would you like to reflect on, on this question? Well, I think it's a, it's a really important point, but I'm lucky that I think Hannah and Fergus are on here to, to maybe uh, to clear up the points that I'm not able to uh, completely answer. Sure. But um, I think similarly to, to the point that I made towards the end of the presentation, because of, uh, because of innovation being at the core of uh, the African identity, especially amongst young populations, work is being done by um, young African agro-tech uh, leaders to, to really come up with initiatives and, 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 and software that is able to support farmers on the ground and pastoralists on the ground to ensure that they're able to rear and effectively produce um, their crop more efficiently. I think that's one element where tech and tech and agriculture seems to often be seen seen on two different sides of uh, of uh, of the world. But in reality, I think these are incredibly important points. Alongside that, I think there are ever ever increasing initiatives being done by governments in the region in order to to, to deal with the the effects of climate change. But the, the sad reality of it is, is I think it's a it's a little bit of a of a chicken and an egg issue here because we need climate change fundamentally to to be less impactful and the only way that can happen is by investment by 96 percent uh, of the rest of the world's emissions to reduce to be to be very frank with you of course africa has its own climate change issues but to a certain extent i think that's a key part i think fergus if there's or hannah if there's anything you'd like to add to that question um yeah just just to add i think um I think there's a there's a sense in which Africa has a lot of um, a lot of, of potential in its own resources which uh, isn't being fully exploited and, and one example um, 
personally, I've been working um, on some uh, some research around the blue economy and Africa's maritime potential, and that's one area which I think speaks to this this issue of um, of sufficient food for the population. I mean, right now, um, Af I think at least 35 um, African states um, are still net importers of fish. But when you look at um, Africa as a continent and the amount of um, of marine resources that it has, the amount, and even those countries which are technically landlocked, but the number of um, of lakes and rivers that are that are open to those kind of resources, um, you know, 35 states are still importing um, importing fish from elsewhere. You know, a majority of them from Europe, for example. Um, you know, 25% of marine catches around Africa are still by non-African countries. So um, these resources aren't really being fully um, exploited for the benefit of Africa itself. And, and one thing which we, we haven't really touched upon, but I think is a, is a major development for the, for the future of the continent is um, the African uh, continental free trade area, which is, has been agreed and is, is kind of slowly coming into, into force. And when that um, is up and running properly, it will create an area for, um, to really boost intra-African trade. And I think that's something that um, will really help Africa provide for itself in this sense and, and stop those kind of unnecessary imports and really and use those, those resources which it does have open to it. Thank you, Fergus. Um, I will group the next three questions together because they're all about foreign investment, economy, and, uh, and things like that. The first one is from Alistair Day, whether the coronavirus will provide um, some opportunity for perhaps African economies to take advantage of the current situation and perhaps expand or, or take up business that maybe other countries couldn't provide. And um, in, in the same sort of manner, Abby, uh, or Abby Williams is asking about the future for, for Africa as a, as a global, global superpower. And another question which we received um, just prior to the session from Abdul Aziz as well, about the future sort of, of, um, of uh, foreign powers investing into Africa. Is that a lighter form of colonialism, you know, given the exploitative nature? and you know cheaper eu imports putting farmers out of business and and things like that so what are your reflections on the sort of growth and development in africa i think hannah might be best placed to answer the the first couple of questions um yeah i'll answer to some points um i think it's true that the covid 19 pandemic um well obviously you know recognizing the intense harm and destruction that's caused should also be seen as an opportunity in some senses um, for strategic kind of pushes in the right direction across the globe, including in Africa. Um, and uh, one thing that we've mentioned before um, and um, is, is the role of technology within that. And I think um, COVID-19 um, has been, um, has given extra impetus to the, to the drive towards um, digitalization um, across the world, um, but it's also about, and it, but it, the, the the state of digital sophistication has also um, been seen to be uh, been seen as uh, you know a, a way in which certain countries and regions have been able to adapt quicker um, than others um, because of that pre-existing state. Um, and so, um, while you know. Uh, you know, some some countries have um, very quickly been able to um, move the you know educational spheres, the commercial spheres, the um, other sectors um, uh, into into kind of remote working um, environments and, and atmospheres. Um, the same you know hasn't been seen in 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 you know a lot a lot of the African continent um, and. That has, um, you know, one thing that we should always recognize is the diversity of uh, the stages that African countries are at and the differing sectoral compositions of um, the, the economies. Um, and so, uh, you know, taking digitalization as an example, um, you know, what, what, where some countries um, have been able to, um, for example, 
you know, introduce e-learning opportunities through, through the internet, others have adapted by um, offering courses through, through radio services. Um, and, and so, and, and so like the, the, the answer to a lot of these questions will, will, where we're talking about Africa, you know, as a whole, will definitely be that it, it depends a lot um, because th there is just such huge diversity and we shouldn't obviously forget that it is, you know, the, the continent with the most countries in the world. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll move on to Fergus also, or Yusuf to add to that question, yeah. that's the answer. Oh, thanks for that, um, Hannah. And I guess um, just to, I think, um, Alistair Day's question about the, the pandemic being an opportunity for Africa, I think that's a, a good starting point to answer um, the final question around, um, I guess, uh, in, you know, these new forms of investment in Africa and whether they represent a, a new form of, of colonialism. So um, I think part of um, uh, part of the opportunity that is open to Africa as a result of the pandemic in an economic sense has resulted from a change in global mindset. I mean, looking at, looking at Europe, for example, um, we've seen the, the EU's kind of um, head of uh, foreign, uh, foreign affairs, uh, Josep Borrell, um, has talked about um, already the fact that um, Europe's, the manufacturing of many of the key medical supplies for Europe is almost entirely concentrated in China. And uh, what this pandemic has shown is that those supply chains are, they're vulnerable um, to the kind of global shock that we're experiencing and they, they can be diversified. And his suggestion was that um, Europe should be looking to invest more into Africa and um, to shorten those supply chains, chains to diversify them. And I think that's a, that's a massive opportunity for Africa in, in this sense. So, I, you know, I don't think it's always about um, taking up business that other countries couldn't, um, couldn't provide, but it's about, um, you know, opening up those, um, those new chains and, and using those, those opportunities effectively. Um, and in terms of the, the question around kind of new forms of um, colonialism and, and exploitation, I think it's an excellent question and it's something that comes up a lot in the context of discussions around China and their investments in, in Africa. That's something we hear a lot about. And, you know, there's a valid concern in the sense that the amount of money that, that China is putting into Africa, you know, raises concerns around the, the debt burden. Um, and, you know, political influence that, that China might have down the line. And that's, again, something we're seeing right now with the economic impact of the pandemic, meaning that, you know, African countries are struggling to, to negotiate their um, debt restructuring with China. Um, one example is ports, for example. Um, a study last year identified 46 um, different port projects in Africa that are ongoing that are funded by the Chinese. And that connects into what I was saying around supply chains, you know, and, and Chinese influence there. Um, but I think if we talk about this only as a kind of form of new colonialism, it maybe misses the fact that African countries have agency in these processes and they are able to influence them and they are able to sway them in directions that ultimately can be beneficial for them. Um, for example, Tanzania recently canceled a $10 billion um, dollar, uh, Chinese loan to finance a port. And you know, that's a huge amount of money in, in the context of any country, um, you know, and especially for some of these African countries, but they have the chance to, to push back on these issues, to negotiate. Um, and I think, you know, we shouldn't overlook that, that agency um, issue there. Thank you. Thank you, Fergus. Uh, can I ask Arian now to ask his question and uh, unmute? Thank you. Hi, can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Arian. I was just wondering, um, because obviously you're talking about how um, Africa can harness its demographics to sell economically into the future, I was wondering how a lot of the headlines now are sort of plagued by ethnic conflicts or internal conflicts, say, you know, South Sudan, which is mixing with the um, sort of oil corruption, Southern Ethiopia, Congo, Libya to an extent of its civil war, uh, insurgencies in the Sahel, which have the religious aspect as well. Um, I was wondering, I'm not, I'm not trying to generalise because all of them are, you know, specific by the very example and change uh, with the in their context, but I was wondering how, with this sort of notions of separatism and ethnic conflict, how do you think the future of that will play out on the African continent and how perhaps 
because of this, obviously, a lot of African countries are plagued by the sort of nation state institutional structure. How will these sort of the demographics and populations of, of Africa really excel to the future by sort of coming over somehow coming over their um, ethnic conflicts and internal conflicts? Thank you. Thank you. Peace and security isn't necessarily my uh, my uh, ex area of expertise, but I think it's a it's a, it's a fascinating, I think, discussion that you that you highlight. I think. I think when, when, when referring to fundamentalism or, or, or insurgencies across the African continent, I think, I think there, is a, there is, of course, larger examples, for example, your Boko Haram, amongst others, your Iswat uh, that we're seeing in the Sahelian region. Um, with regards to the demographics of that, I think, yes, there is a, there is a, there is a possibility where you will see a reflection of an increase in, in desolate young people finding themselves at home within some of these uh, these these extreme or these 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 Islamist groups uh, in the context of of course Boko Haram amongst others, but I think what we're also seeing is an active effort being done by countries, including that of Nigeria, with their Operation Safe Corridor project, which which aims to to carry out effective uh, uh, de-escalation, disarmament, and 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 actually. Um, reframing what extremism is in the mind of many of these young people and providing them with opportunities and i think opportunity is probably where the best place to, to to go with a question like this i think once we see a increase in opportunity for young people on the continent once we see their socio-economic um, conclusions being met uh, in, a, in a much more substantial way i think you'll see that a lot of the demographic changes will result in net positives versus net negatives like that of like that of uh, of course uh, um, the, the examples that you've already mentioned. I think similarly, and, and I think it's a, it's a good point, point you mentioned within your, within your question, which is I think it's, it's difficult to make generalizations um, when it comes to the African continent specifically on this issue. I think this is an issue that we see across the globe and, and the, vast, the vast majority are often linked to socioeconomic deprivation as a, as a key factor in, in, in radicalization. So, so I think I hope that answers your, your, your question with regards to where the future of this discussion can go. But I think the hope for many of us and the hope for, I'm, I'm sure, each and every one of you is that we'll see uh, better circumstances leading to, to, to the, this, this, this situation of, of increased radicalism not actually occurring. Um, Fergus, Hannah, do either of you have anything to add to that? All, all I'd add to that is just I think it, it, a lot of those, those issues around um, conflict also tie in quite well with what we've talked about technology and, and digitalization um, and how those link to, to democracy. Um, I, you know, one of the things that is, is important to an important and kind of core value of Chatham House is the importance of a, a free and a vibrant media space. But I think there's also challenges um, linked to that around fake news um, and misinformation. Um, and when you have a continent that, you know, as Yusuf um, mentioned in his introduction is is so young and also has access to these technologies um it's i think it's really important to to show that even though those there's a, a real positive trend with that as it relates to democracy you also need to find ways to combat the challenges of of misinformation and how those can um, contribute to to conflict as well Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are now out of time. Thank you so much for your contributions, for so many questions we have received. I still see so many raised hands. Hopefully, we are continuing um, the team as well with our next speaker. So hopefully, you might be able to ask your questions then. But in the meantime, I would like to say thank you to, to my colleagues from the Africa program. And um, very quickly, please you know, remain in touch with, with my colleagues, you know, they're all on the website, you can find their emails and we will share their PowerPoints. Hannah has provided a great reading list as well for the summer, so there is uh, quite a lot of materials online as well. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you. Thank you guys and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now while we are waiting for, for session two to start and my colleague Ben to join me, uh, I believe we have a short survey. We are going to send you very quickly and just have a little bit of a comfort break if you need a cup of coffee or some water uh, while we are waiting and please uh, provide your feedback. I'm sorry we were not able to get to all the questions 
I think we are also very, um, we try to share as much as we can from, from our work and from, from all the things that, that we are doing here at Chatham House. So we'll just have to be better in, in the time management.